It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last prophet. Summa salatullah wa salamullah ala al-hadi al-rasulillah. It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last prophet. Summa salatullah wa salamullah. Qad aflaha man zakkaha. That successful indeed is the one who purifies this nafs. You are fear for Allah, but you also fear other people? No. Don't fear anybody else, illa Allah, except Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is telling us, good words are better. Good words, words of advice, is better than the one who gives charity, but followed by reproach. So there are different levels of tests, and Allah decides who he's going to test. The first level of testing, of course, is with our own nafs. Esteemed by his companions that Allah had mentioned The noble description in the Holy Quran Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahu bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحياء لا يأتي إلا بخير سرق الله وسرق رسوله الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters, firstly, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator and our master, who has made us as the best of his creation, who has fashioned us and designed us in the best of all forms. As he mentioned to us in the Holy Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ that certainly we have created man and we have fashioned man in the best of all forms, the best design. His anatomy, his bodily, his physiology has been made in the best of all ways. That suited to a man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the man in that manner. And that which is suited for a female and a, a woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also created her in the best of all manner. Her physiology, her physique, has been made in that manner which best suits her. We thank Allah that he has created us as human beings and that he has made us as believers. My dear respected brothers and sisters, Islam teaches us the best of all conduct and character. It teaches us that which is good for us in this world and that which is good for us, and better for us in the Akhirah. And at the same time, Islam prohibits from us bad character, bad conduct, vices, and evil traits. You know, there is a saying that a person who may have all things, but yet has no character, is like a corpse that has been shrouded but the most beautiful of shroud. Do you think the beautiful shroud would prevent the stench from coming out after a while? No. That stench will still emanate from the shroud, even though it may be looking the most glamorous and beautiful of all shrouds. After a while, that dead body, that, that corpse, 
will give off that scent. This is a similitude to us with respect to having good character within us and good traits. That if it is we have good traits in us, we are like the living. And with the living who takes care of that and maintains themselves, of course, they will be amicable to others. They will have good sense, a good look. They would be, you know, um, nice to be around with. However, those people who do not have good conduct and good character, their similitude is like a corpse that has just been shrouded with something looking nice. But beneath that, there's the rotted smell, stinking and the, the, the stench, the fetish smell that comes out and emanates. So which one of these we would like to be from amongst? Of course, you want to be like a living who takes care of themselves and takes care of the body. This is putting Iman into our lives and then taking care of that Iman and beautifying it with good character and good conduct. So therefore, we should put into our lives good conduct and character, having good qualities like sincerity, thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, compassion, having mercy for the youngsters, respect for those who are older than us, devotion and concentration in our ibadat and our worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inculcating qualities such as patience and charity, giving to those who are in need, etc. These are some examples of good character that we can put into our lives. And we should avoid those things which are bad, ungratefulness, uncontrollable anger, miserliness, pride, haughtiness. All of these things we should try to avoid. Among these types of vices, my dear respected brothers and sisters, we have the vice of fahsha, of bad character, fahsha. Fahsha, we sometimes translate as being something of an immoral nature, a major sin, something of immodesty. And among the different types of fahsha that you will have, there will be things such as adultery coming under it, fornication, alcohol, incest, homosexuality, lesbianism, same-sex marriages. These are some of the things which come under the topic of fahsha. What has Islam taught us with respect to this particular act or what we consider to be fahsha? What has the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa informed us, what he has guided us towards as regarding these things? And we know that in our present condition here, over the world, same-sex marriages, homosexuality, lesbianism is something which is popular, which has been made law, and they have rights, and it is something that is recognized. And in the recent past, we have the statement, you know, monkey see, monkey do. So we hope that we don't follow suit and try to follow those who have already gone down that direction. I don't want to call anyone monkey, but we do not want to follow suit in that direction as regarding imitating and following other people. Perhaps they may feel that that is good for them. We should not also do like that. And as Muslims and as believers, we must know what is our law on Islam concerning this, that we can try to safeguard ourselves, that we can safeguard our family, that we can safeguard our children, that we can safeguard the next generation to come concerning these types of immoral acts. The Quran is clear concerning having good virtues. The hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is clear concerning inculcating you know, good morals, modesty into our lives, which is the opposite of those type of indecent things. It is part of our iman 
that we must adhere to a type of shame, type of shyness, modesty in our lives. It is part of our deen. A person who does not have that, he is lacking in his iman. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith, al-iman bid'un wa sab'un shu'batan. That faith, iman, it is divided into some 70 something parts. If you were to take faith and look at all of the different branches and the different parts of it, it is divided into 70 something parts, different shu'ba. He then went on to explain, Then the most excellent of all of these branches, it is the statement of La ilaha illallah. The statement with belief and sincerity that there is no one to be worshipped but Allah, that he is our creator, that he is our master, that he is the one who takes care of our needs, that he is the most powerful, that nothing can be done except with his permission. Qawlu la ilaha illallah. The statement of Iman, the highest of all of those things. Because with this statement and with this firmness of belief in the heart, a person becomes a Muslim. He now has Iman in his heart. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then mentions, وَأَدْنَاهُ And the least of him, وَأَدْنَاهُ The least of all of these branches, it is, إِمَاتَةُ الْأَذَىٰ عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ It is the removal of some harmful thing from the pathway. So if for instance we are passing on the roadway and we see a broken bottle or a stone or something of that nature which can harm someone, someone who is not observing it, then to take up that and remove it, put it at the side or, or discard of it properly. This is part of our Iman. It is part of our faith. By doing this, a person's faith becomes even more complete. And then the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِّنَ الْإِيمَانِ And haya, modesty, having good morals, having, you know, shyness, decency, it is part of one's iman. It is one of those branches of iman. In another narration, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, al hayau that haya, shyness, modesty, la ya'ti illa bi khayrin. It does not bring anything except goodness. Having proper, this proper character of modesty and shyness in one's life, it only brings goodness to a person. There is only benefit that can be derived from it. In another hadith, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Hayau. kulluhu. That haya, all of it, is good. It is good. And this haya, it has to be maintained in front of one's rub foremost. Allah is looking at us at all times. If we have this concept, well, then all the problem is solved. At every moment, Allah, our Rabb and our Master, He is looking at us. We have this concept that Allah is looking at us, His Malaika is looking at us. So even in the taking out of the clothing, even when we are with our spouses, a sense of haya and shame should be maintained. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would advise that one cover themselves. That even taking a bath, sometimes it is good to keep on some part of the clothing, especially over the private areas. And if it is when a person going to the, the washroom, say the doors, it covers the glances and, and prevents the evil jinnats from entering and looking at a person. So it teaches us this aspect of higher Allah, He is looking at us. Then would we, then would we do something that is indecent? Would we go and commit adultery when we know that Allah is looking at us? No, a person would not do that. Would we commit fornication, unmarried relationship? No, we would not. Because we know that Allah is looking at us. We are shy before Allah. We have this quality of haya before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the foremost. But then, there is that aspect of haya amongst one another. We would not remove our clothing we might do so with our own selves, yes, in our, in our room by, by oneself. But we will not do so in front of other people. That's a sense of haya as well. 
Okay? Walk the street naked. You will not do that. Yeah, because that sense of shyness has to be there between one another. You will not do so, you know, um, in front of our children. And all of these things, when there's a breakdown of this higher, then from one problem, it leads to an X, another problem. When one thing is left out, which is necessary to be done, which is part of our deen, and in that doing, a person commits a sin, then this now leads to another sin, and another thing. And then a person forgets, okay, he forgets actually that this is the sin that he's committing. He's forgetting that this is the wrong thing that is being done. If it is that we would adhere to proper Islamic teachings on Haya, then many of the problems that are taking place, it would be removed. Incest, all of those things. It is not proper that two children, they lie in the same bed and they are covered under the same sheet once they reach the age of, of seven or even before that if they feel that there is some suspicion among them in recognizing the sexual areas of other people, then we should try to separate if in the same bed yet at that early age, but not under the same sheet. And yet we have parents, you have the male sleeping with their adult daughters under the same sheet. At night, what happens? The hand rubs all over, and then from one thing, it leads to an next. So you break that law, then it leads to a more severe situation sleeping with, with small children, and you're thinking as a joke, but then playing with them, touching them in the wrong places, then from one thing, it leads to another thing. That as children grow old at 10 years, becoming to, to, you know, in that state of when they become balik and mature, their rooms should be separated at least. If the same sex, they should be separated with respect to their beds. They should not be sleeping on the same bed in that manner. Nowadays, we go with the concept, well, he have what I have, she has what I have. So what is the big difference? You understand? We grew up with this type of mentality. But this is an un-Islamic thing. When there's a lack of shame, then problems start taking place one to the next. That the mother, she should be foremost in dealing with the girl children. And the father, he should be foremost in training the boy children. When there is a mixture of, of, really, of, of, of this um, duty, then what happens? The son then to he then tend to develop what? Woman quality in his life. And women then tend to develop mannish quality in their life. They become boyish, call them a tomboy sometimes. Okay? Why? Because of the mixture of the different level of duty and responsibility that we have to each other. It doesn't mean that a father should love the daughter less. He should love her more. Doesn't mean that the, the mother should not love the son and deal with him like that. That must be there. Parental love is important and guidance is important. But understand that there are different roles that has to be played by parents as the children grow up. And when these are not fulfilled properly and the proper haya and decency is not taught to children at an early age, then what happens? They grow up with a sense of carefree attitude. Thinking that, okay, that is allowed because daddy and mommy used to allow me to do that. Uncle said I no problem. Understand? My friend thinks that that is okay. And many a time a person picks up the vices, if not from parents themselves, then from the friends that they keep. Why are you smoking? Because I see daddy smoking. What is wrong with that? If daddy could smoke, then I could smoke. Understand? Why are you looking at on television? Because last night when I wake up, I didn't, daddy didn't see me. But I saw him looking at something on the television. So if it is good for you, I could see it as well. And we tend to go along with that type of attitude. So training from parents is an important thing with respect to fahsha, with respect to you know, avoiding from fahsha and inculcating haya in one's life, good morals and good training in one's life. Because as the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, al-hayau la ya'ati illa bi khayrin, that haya and decency, good morals, modesty, it only lead towards goodness. Whilst on the other hand, we're talking about fahsha now. What does this lead to? What, what really are we doing when we engage in this? As believers, 
We have the duty of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ati Allah, wa ati Rasul, wa ulul amri minkum. Obey Allah, obey the messenger, and those in authority over you. Aye? That is when those in authority, they are commanding you with that which is haq, which is truth. So, we are told to obey Allah, obey the messenger, but when a person engages in fahsha, who actually he is obeying? He is obeying the shaitan. That is obedience to shaitan. Now he has taken the shaitan as his leader. The Quran tells us, Inna ma ya'murukum bisu'i wal fahsha. That he, shaitan, he commands you. He orders you. Besu with evil actions, with evil deeds, with vices. Well, fahsha, and with immodesty, immorality, indecency. So shaitan commands you with these things. So when a person commands, another one listening, follow, what is he doing? He is obeying. Isn't that so? So when a person gets a thought in his head that I should go and commit fornication, who is giving him that thought? Who is giving him that, that command? Shaitan. When he fulfills that, then he has become a servant of shaitan. Instead of becoming a servant of Allah, he is now becoming a servant of shaitan in the sense that he is now obeying shaitan. He is obeying shaitan. So shaitan, he commands you with evil, well, fahsha, and with immodesty. And that you should say things about Allah that which you have no knowledge of. That you should say things about Allah that which you have no knowledge of. Nowadays you have people making claim that you, Muslims, Muslim youths, claiming that they want gay rights in Islam, that, you know, Islam has allowed it. And they are saying things. When, when such claims are being made, then the effect is that they are saying that Allah and His Rasul has allowed it. That if Islam has allowed that, then it is as though Allah and His Rasul has allowed that. That they are saying things about Allah, that which they have no knowledge about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us, That he, Allah, he has prohibited fahsha. He has prohibited indecency. He has prohibited adultery, fornication, same-sex relationship. He has prohibited all of these things. And that do not say that Allah has done so. In one ayat of the Holy Quran, in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, commanding the Rasul, commanding the Prophet, قُلْ Say to them, أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَ That Allah, He does not command towards fahsha. So whosoever makes such claim and say that, okay, Islam has something that tells us that we should also have right. We are Muslim, but we are gays. Are you making a claim that Allah has ordered that and has allowed that? That is totally prohibited. It is not permissible. That Allah SWT is, is telling us clearly. Kul, anna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not order towards fahsha, towards these types of action. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even want us to go close to it. Anything of this nature. When he tells us in the Holy Quran, wala taqrabu zina. Do not even come close to zina. And zina can be considered like fornication, adultery. Okay? But these type of actions as well, same-sex relationship, that also falls under a meaning of it, okay? that it also prohibits even coming close to that. And so for that reason, sometimes the, 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 the jurists would even say that those boys who probably are very handsome, beardless, they should be very careful. Just as, you, just as your, your, your young daughters are going out, you should be very careful with them because just as there are people who are preying on these young girls, there are those who are preying on the young boys as well. And that is the truth of the matter. A person will check out the scenes, and when they pass back, they start to, as we say, start to say some sort of a lyrics against them. You look a nice boy. And start off with that and one thing to the next. And before long, if no check, is there a person now becomes you know hooked on 
on those type of vices. And also, we must be careful. Thus, even the aspect of same-sex relationship, it also comes under this, la takra bu zina. Do not even come close to zina. Far less to engage in these type of actions as well. Nowadays, we see that the media is propagating this. Every time you check the papers, some kind of thing about it, letters being written on the media, even people protesting and marching. We are saying all this so that we would not become passive about the issue. We should not become passive and say, well, that's them fellas business. That, that, that really concerns me. Yeah, the scholars will speak about it. But every Muslim must understand when something wrong is taking place. And right now, these things are coming to our shores. We must feel the wrong in us. And if you have the ability to speak out against it, speak out against it. I'm not saying become hostile, but speak out against it. What input can we make to stop it? We must do so. Because if we do not do anything and we take an attitude like that don't bother me, it's only sometime when these things affect us personally. Then we say, you know something, I should really be doing something all the while. So become sensitized towards the issue and deal with it, know that it is wrong. Train our children, if you see any kind of funny behavior, then deal with it at an early stage before it grows into something that cannot be controlled. So there are those who will be propagating it. Do not condone things and say, well, that them fellas right with them. And you know, that, that don't bother me. It should bother us to the extent that we feel it wrong in our heart that what they are doing is wrong. The Quran tells us about those people who propagate it, that inna ladina yuhibbuna anta shi'al fahishatu, that verily those who love that fahisha spread. Listen to this. Verily those people who love that fahisha, this type of indecent thing, spread. Fil ladina amanu, among the believers. In other words, you, 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 you try to reach out this type of indecency towards the believers. Get them with you. By association, get them to condone it. Tell them that, listen, I don't know, you know, they might say, for instance, that I know um, you all don't do them, those type of things, but don't say nothing. To condone it, to go along with it, become easy going with it. They are spreading this type of thing. So the Quran is telling us there is those who love that fahisha that is spread amongst the believers. Then what is the consequence? Lahum adhabun alim. For them is a painful punishment. Fit dunya wal akhira. In this world, they will get a punishment in this world. Wal akhira. And in the hereafter. One of the things about it in this world is that Allah will place dishonor to them. Allah wants to put disgrace upon them. And for some people, and for some nation who had engaged in it fully, and are in full support of it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may send certain catastrophes and adversities upon them that destroy the entire nation. Just like, for instance, the people of Lut, that when they had practiced this, and it was something which is common amongst them, and only Prophet Lut, alayhi salatu salam, amongst the men and his family, they were the ones who were fighting against it. It became second nature with the people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he destroyed them. You know, the Quran mentions to us about these people. That Prophet Nuh, Lut, alayhi salatu salam, he was telling them, Atatun al-Fahisha. Are you approaching these type of indecency? Are you going toward these types of immoral actions? Ma sabakakum biha min ahade min al alameen, such that no one from before had practiced it. That they were amongst the first people who would have practiced it. Some say as a nation, they had practiced it, and that they now had considered to be allowable for them as a nation. That this level of it did not exist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lut alayhi salam told them, Inna kum la ta'atuna rijala shahwata min duna nisa. Are you approaching men instead of women with that type of shahwa and that desire? 
that sexual desire that a man would normally have towards a woman? Are you approaching men with that type of sexual desire? But antum muslifun. But rather, you are a people who have exceeds all limits. You have exceeded the limits. So they had the same fahisha as Prophet Lut alayhi salam told them, Ata'atun al fahisha. Are you approaching fahisha? It comes in that same meaning that all of those prohibitions in the Holy Quran and the hadith spoke about fahisha. Are you approaching women, in, uh, men instead of women? This is unnatural, my dear respected brothers and sisters. It is natural that the male be inclined towards the female. Allah SWT has created us in peers, male and female. The Quran in so many places have mentioned to us that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has created us as males and females that we will recognize each other, that we will know each other. It is true this procreation will take place. If it is that this becomes something rampant, what happens? It becomes the decline of mankind. Because how? How would it be that procreation will continue? It just leads to the lessening of mankind. In one generation, upon the next generation, and as people die out, what would happen? The race of mankind would also die because this is unnatural. People with a little common sense would understand. It is not natural. The, the, the autonomy of the human being has been created. The physique, the physiology of the human being has been made such that a male complements a female in the fulfillment of such desires. And as such, it is a natural thing again. Therefore, when we engage in it, and a community, and a people engage in it, we know there are pockets all the time, all over the place, all over the world, before it became legalized in many states. There were pockets all over, because the sin had started then and it continued. It continued over the era. But when it became legalized as something which the, the, the country in itself has allowed, then as a nation we are liable to face the torment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as the people of Lut, they were destroyed, in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused rains of stones upon them. What is the law with respect to a person committing adultery? In Islam, adultery is to stone to death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rained stones upon them, destroyed them. And then, since they turned the other way, with respect to the, uh, the, normal, the normal affection and desire towards, towards female and said that they change and they turn towards men, Allah SWT turned them, the entire city. The entire city was lifted up and then they were turned and they were sunk into the ground. This was the effect of it. Because they changed their lifestyle, they were also turned and destroyed in that manner. And over the years, we see that many people who practice this there are many other types of consequences that come about from this. My dear respected brothers and sisters, it is not something that we should take lightly. It is something that is a very serious matter. As believers, we, in our own capacity, without being hostile, in that sense, because we are living in such a place that, you know, towards us, there is no apparent hostility, we should make our mark as regarding stopping it. Do something. So perhaps even if the people do not pay uh, um, heed to it, and it becomes part of the law, at least when we stand before Allah, you say, oh Allah, I did my part. I said my part. I influence those under my control. Otherwise, what account would we give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah? What account would we give? When people engage in it, and there are many hadiths that speaks about it, that it brings about the la'anat of Allah, the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, it brings about the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one hadith 
the Prophet ﷺ mentions, لا ينظر الله عز وجل إلى رجل أتى رجلا ومرأة في دبرها. That Allah subhanahu wa taala, He does not even look towards a person, a male, who approaches a man and a woman from the back, meaning in the respective relationship. Allah doesn't look at that person. That person now becomes, when, Allah, when it is mentioned Allah does not look at that person, it means that there is curse for such person. Also, in one narration, it is mentioned that the curse of, of God, the curse of Allah, is on the one who commits homosexuality. The line of Allah, the curse of Allah, is upon that one who commits sex, homosexuality. And this was mentioned three times. When they mention the curse of Allah, it means that that person is very far away from the rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our next narration, in Tabrani, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is mentioned that, um, that when homosexuality is committed excessively, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away his helping hand from his creatures and does not take notice of the place where they are destroyed. So they'll be destroyed, meaning that because of the action, all help is taken away, and eventually they will be destroyed. There is a statement of Hazrat Abdullah ibn Abbas. He says that when homosexual dies, and in such a state that they do not repent before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the consequence is that they are turned into swines in their graves. Now we can list many things, one after the next, that shows that this is an act of abomination, that it should not be condoned, that one should not in no way support it, but rather try to protect ourselves from such happenings. If we do not do so, then we may fall prey to it, our family may even fall prey to it, and then at that day, then we will hold our head and cry and say, if only, if only, if only I had taken some active stands before, or, or at least protect my family from such, then perhaps this would not have happened. It would not have happened. This, my dear respected brothers and sisters, it is one of those abominations as a sign before Kiyama that will be taken place. You know that it's going to happen. The Rasul Sallallahu had already mentioned it to us. But let us do our part. Let us do our part with respect to trying to let this come into being. People say that that is their rights and they can do whatever they want. But we do not support even the rights of a person that is totally wrong. At least we cannot acknowledge that as being something that is right. So I pray and hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgive us. And he strengthened us with such iman that we would be able to abstain from the many fitans and the many acts of corruptions and tests that will come before Qiyamah. We ask and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also protect our generation, protect the ummah from such fitans as well. alhamdulillah it's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last Prophet Summa Salatullah wa Salamullah ala al Hadi ya Rasulillah. It's the greatest gift from Allah to be in the last Prophet Summa Salatullah wa Salamullah ala al Hadi ya Rasulillah. What can we set of Mustafa?